I know what Satan does to a lost sinner, but I also know they fight with themselves about getting saved. Is this the best thing to do for me? Should I really do it? What's going on? I don't really know. And they're opposing themselves like they do in the book of Acts. That's why it's vitally, crucially important for you and I to pray before we go witness to somebody. And that the Lord would give us the right boldness and the right open door, because I don't know what that is. And I forced many a witness and made a mess of it. Because I had to witness and I had to give him a track. And God may have said, what are you doing, man? I got somebody else for that task. Anyway, Psalm 39. I'm not going to get into all this morning, but that's okay. Psalm 39. Felt the inspiration of the Holy Ghost there, Brother Mange. You know what I'm talking about. Starts handling snakes and speaking in tongues, man. <laughs> Psalm chapter 39. I said Ecclesiastes, but I think you'll... Pick up what the Lord's laying down as we read this, and then we'll pray and we'll get into it this morning. Psalm 39, to the chief musician, even to Jedathun, a psalm of David. I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Now, that's some good New Testament doctrine from an Old Testament saint, not even in the body of Christ. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace, even from good. And my sorrow was stirred. Wow, there's even a time not to say even something good. Hmm. My heart was hot within me. I just got to, I'm burning. I got to say this. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. Those stupid, wicked people, they just knew how good I was. And but No, look what he says with all that burning and what he wants to say to other people. Look how it refracts back to him. Lord, make me to know mine end. And to measure my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. This is a king that's wiped out tens of thousands of people, that's taken Goliath down. And he says, Lord, you know what? I want to go at it at these people. I want to give them everything I got to say in that. Lord, would you just make me know how many days I got left on this earth? And he could wipe you out with his bare hands. He killed a bear and a lion. With his bare hands. Oh, that, that must be CGI, AI. No, it's the power of God on a man. And he killed a bear and a lion. Next time, you know what? Next time you go to the zoo, <laughs> offer to feed a man and then go in there and just play around with one of those kitty cats, man. Actually, don't feed him and then go in there and see what you can do with one of those things. Well, that's just in the Bible. Listen, you've watched more dumb, stupid stuff on the TV in the last seven days. Then when God says something true that really happened, you're like, man, that couldn't really happen. But you watch Thor and everybody else, other idiot. Right. Right. Okay, we're not even preaching yet. We've got to get into the back of this, man. But I said, then I speak one more time. Oh, one more thing about verse number three. Now, I'm not against six flags or anything like that, Justin. I'm not going to pick on you right now, right? <laughs> My kids like to like that stuff, too. But you know what they call those places besides stupid money takers? They call them amusements, don't they? What does it mean to muse on something? It means to think about, to ponder, to ruminate, to stew about it. If you're amusing, what are you not doing? Not you're not thinking. Interesting. So, I'm not, well, listen, man, if you've got a season pass, man, have, have at it, man. Go love King Kong and Superman and every other thing. I'm not going on a roller co coaster. I'm naturally tall. I don't have to go get heights anywhere else. And you guys love devils if you love roller coasters. Yeah. Something wrong with you, man. <laughs> You love those high places. The high places, you, 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 you stinking devils. Stinking satanic amusement park devils. Verse 4. The <laughs> Bible says in verse 4, we ain't even got it going yet, man. Verse 4 says this, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days what it is that I may know how frail I am. Whew. Behold, thou hast made my days as an hand breath, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Sila, look at me for a minute. A hand breath, a hand breath. That's how long your life is. 
how dare you think you've got something against a God that's eternal? The oldest person in the Bible is 969 years old, didn't make it even to a day in God's calendar, a day with the Lord's a thousand years. You didn't even live a day in God's world. And you think you're something at 969, you think you're something at 120 years when you're going up against something that's eternal? That, David, this is a king, the king. And he says, you know what, man, my days are... That's how long they are, man. And then he says, which is a great verse for everybody, you know what your best state is today? Vanity. You talk about a stinging verse, Brother Paul, from Sunday school. Wow. So in case you got up this morning, I thought you were in great shape. Bench five bills, run a four-minute mile, compete in the Olympics. God said, Vanity. Surely every man walking in a vain show. <laughs> Surely they are disquiet in vain. How many times is he going to keep saying vain? We're getting to Ecclesiastes. He's going to have some more to say about that. His son will have some things to say about that. He heaped up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not to reproach the foolish. I was dumb. That means he can't speak. That doesn't mean he doesn't have any intellect. You know that by the next part of the verse because the King James Bible, God always explains himself. I open not my mouth. Okay? Because thou didst it. Remove thy stroke away from me. You didn't know what a stroke was. It's not just a, a heart issue. Look what the next part of the verse says. Remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. What is a stroke? It's a blow upside the head, as Frank Brown would say from the left side of town. Verse 11. When thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Think about that for uh, the next man when you're walking down the runway in Paris showing off the latest fashion. You're a moth. You know what happens when you squish your moth and it leaves that nice powder stain there? If you have not squished your moth, sorry, PETA, I kill them all. Yeah. In fact, I turn on all the lights in my house to make sure they get attracted to them. Then I just go up to them and I just decim I decimate their world. The Bible says that surely every, look at this, surely every man is vanity. You're compared to a moth. Hey, I don't like that talk. Then this is probably not the right church for you. Because the King James Bible is what takes precedence and not what you and I feel. Selah, hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace in my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. Spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. Father, please, through the power of the Spirit of God, speak through me to you. Bring honor and glory to yourself, number one. That, Father, Jesus Christ might be magnified. That you speak to each and every soul here, Father, saved or lost you would deal with them particularly about their eternity, whether for the saved, the judgment seat of Christ, or for the lost, their need to trust the Savior before it's eternally too late. Father, what a crushing psalm to the pride that I have, that my best state is altogether vanity. On my best day, Father, the best thing I could do, you look down and go, nothing. It equals nothing in your sight. Thank you for the reality of your Bible, Father. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. I do pray for the services down in Ledyard. You fill Brother Herb with the Spirit of God and the others that will be ministering to the lost. May they see their need for Jesus Christ as their Savior as well. And that, Father, uh, may some sinners be turned from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, for all the honor and glory to go back to you. I do thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. So that's a kickoff right there. And you say, what are you doing in Psalms? Well, Ecclesiastes chapter number 1, verse 1 says this. We're not going to go verse by verse. We're just going to pick some stuff out for the next few weeks, Lord willing. And I know we've hit this book before. I, I like this book a lot. You say, well, you, do you say that about every one of them? Yeah, not Jeremiah, I don't. Okay? And Song of Solomon because, I, well, it's just not the way it's going to roll. Well, you don't love your wife. No, I just... I can't read about that stuff and not get all ooky and weird, man. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, you're like, oh, I love that book. <laughs> Megan and I look at each other and read that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lam now, see, n finally, I finally pulled it out of you. The, la the Lamentations. Thank God you got saved, man. Amen. Amen. That's it. When I look at Megan, I think of Lamentations. Hey, tra time of Jacob's trouble. Praise the Lord, man. Mike, you know what? You come up here and preach. I think you, you got the Holy Ghost on you, man. Amen. Whew. I like Ecclesiastes. A couple things about it as you get started here. It's a weird position in your Bible. You have the book of the unhappy man in Job. We still talk about it Wednesday night. You have the book of the happy man in Psalms. You have the book of the wise man in Proverbs. You have the book of the 
heavenly man, Song of Solomon, and then sandwich in between all that good stuff between Job to Song of Solomon, you have a book called Ecclesiastes, the book of the worldly man. Now Solomon, as we're going to read in a second here, Solomon is the son of David. You would think that Solomon had picked some things up from his dad, and I, I do believe as you read through this, you will see that he did pick some things up. Because you saw from Psalm 39 the word vanity pop up and vain pop up many times. And if there's anything you'll get out of this next few weeks is that it's not meant to be discouraging for the Word of God, but it's to give you a sober look at the way God views things. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. We quote that verse in Psalm, uh, Isaiah 55, uh, 8 and 9 and all that, but we don't really believe it. And we try to make God think like we think and God act like we la uh, act and, and put him in a little box and all that. He's not like that. As you heard in Sunday school, outside of this King James Bible, you don't know about God. You know about burning mountains and smoking mountains and Ten Commandments, because Charlton Heston did such a good job. You know, about a, you know about a flood that wiped everybody out. And those. You don't know much about God, particularly if you're a Gentile. But thank God you have a book in your lap that's inspired by Almighty God, purified by Almighty God, called the King James Bible. And I do believe in every jot and every tittle of that book. I really do. I believe the uh, punctuation marks. I believe everything is exactly where God put it for this reason. Ecclesiastes falls in between a really good group of books. And you're wondering, why would God upset the flow of the wise man, the happy man? Why would you do that? Even Job ends well. And then all of a sudden you tuck Ecclesiastes in there. It's a sobering thing for you and I because as New Testament Christians, and if you're saved, that's what you are. You're in the body of Christ. We live the bulk of our lives under the sun. We are not heavenly minded. Uh, I've heard this phrase for decades uh, being saved that, uh, well, he's, he's just so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. I've never met a saved person so heavenly minded. They are no earthly good. And I knew, do know one person who was so heavenly minded, he was really earthly good. His name's the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Not my will, but thine be done. Whatever the will of the Father is, I came to do his will, not my. I think he was perfectly heavenly minded, and I think he did a lot of good down here. He could talk to publicans and harlots and drunkards and, and those out of sorts, the religious lost. He could talk to anybody. So don't tell me you're so heavenly minded, no earthly good. No, we as saved people, and that's we, I'm in the boat with you. We live the bulk of our lives under the sun and not above the sun. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, you have three heavens in your King James Bible. You have from the ground to the top of our atmosphere. Well, I don't remember what it was, ionosphere, troposphere. I don't really know which one it is. But once you get past that, you're in the uh, quote-unquote outer space, correct? So outer space would be the second heaven where the sun, moon, stars, constellation are, and all those things, the meteors and all those things that, you know, that evolution put together over the last 20 billion years. It, <laughs> right. Uh, evolution's a joke. It's a lie from the pit of hell. And you need to go read that book, Origin of the Species, and see what he really thought about certain races of people. And go read about that garbage. It's out of the pit of hell. And that's what your nation's had for the last 140 years. So you know why man acts more like beasts nowadays? Because that's what he's been taught to be. You know why men like, act like animals and you call them, hey, he's a real beast? Because that's what you've been taught for the last 150 years through devolution. And I did call it devolution for a reason. You didn't come from a monkey. You didn't come from a one cell amoeba. God made you from the dust of the ground. And you came, lady, from the rib of a man. You believe that? Yes. Every bit of it. Where do you think life would come from other than a garden? Come on, man. You think, you think, I sound like Joe Biden right there. Brother Guido's like, I'm going to cast my vote for Biden. My preacher sounds like Biden. Man. <laughs> He didn't start, come on, man. I did. Yes. With the fellas from Dorchester. The, um, I'm just saying, you, th you think you came here by accident? That's also in chapter number one. We're not going to hit that this morning. God laid out the precipitation, evaporation, and condensation cycle rate in Ecclesiastes chapter one. How did they know that back then? Oh, I don't know. God, who was here before the beginning. Where was God before the beginning? I am. I'm from Everlasting. Where's Everlasting? I don't know. It's just an address out in Everlasting. <laughs> Where do you think he, he's, ever, he's eternal? My little pea brain can't comprehend that. Yeah. And don't tell me you're like the person said last night, I'm an atheist. No, you're not. You're a fool. Yes. You know why you think you're an atheist? 
You know why you want to believe you're an atheist? You don't want to be judged. Exactly. You don't want to be held accountable. You think that if I just keep on living my life, nobody will hold me accountable. You're dead wrong. The God that made you, your creator. Another theme in the book of Ecclesiastes. He made you. He knows everything about you. And he's watching you. And there is a record book. Thank God the blood of Jesus Christ can wipe that all away and start you anew and make you a new creature in Christ Jesus, man. So I believe Ecclesiastes is right where it needs to be, but it's the, car it's the carnal man, the worldly man. It's the under the sun. It's the, it's the vanity of life, and unfortunately, that's where most of us live our lives. If I, if I was to give you a companion book in the New Testament, it would be Colossians, because Colossians deals with Laodicea. We studied that on a Wednesday night a few Wednesday nights ago. And Colossians deals with the fact that Laodicea is lukewarm, and the Lord Jesus Christ would just wants to spew you out of his mouth. Because we're just neither hot nor cold. We're all over the... You know why? Because we're not heavenly minded. Of those three heavens where... And I'm sorry, I skipped over that. The third heaven is where God... That's my fault for getting all wrapped up in that. The second heaven is where the sun, moon, stars are. The third heaven is where God dwells. So if you're under the sun in Ecclesiastes, what is your mind? How far can your mind and your heart go? As far as the sun will take you. What's above the sun in the solar system? God. That's heavenly minded. You have three heavens, Psalm 148, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, and that's, that's where God wants us to be. And as I was saying, Colossians ch uh, chapter 3 in particular, we'll get there in a little while, that will show you how to have a heavenly mind, not an earthly, under-the-sun mind. Come on, folks, we all have lives, we all have jobs that we work in, we all have things that we have to do, but I don't have to let that thing consume my life. I don't have to let it take me over. I don't want to be like Solomon. Folks, he's the richest man of his era. Yeah. The Bible's very clear in 1 Kings chapter 10, uh, 10 23 to 26. He's, he, excel, he excels in all the riches and wisdom of all the kings on the earth combined. He has apes and peacocks. That boy has a zoo before anybody else has a zoo. He's got a throne that's complete ivory overlaid with gold. He's the richest man. He's got a thousand women. I don't care what you think about that. And I'm not being filthy or perverse one bit when I say this. There's nothing that man couldn't have from a fleshly perspective at his disposal at any time. And you and I today, you say, well, what? I don't have a thousand women. Sure you do. Oh, I don't eat or have wealth like Solomon. Hey, Uber Eats, could you bring me a grinder from Jersey Mike's? So you're not thinking, oh, I'm not rich like Solomon. I bet you Solomon, if he came down with all that money and saw what we have, he'd freak out, man. Yeah. You order, I, or, I ordered a router one day for our house. We had a, a router for the Wi-Fi thing. Ordered from Best Buy. It was the best, it was the best deal, the Best Buy. <laughs> and the Best Buy, and I got, that foolish thing, I ordered that at 10 o'clock in the morning. They show up at like 1.30 in the afternoon on my door, so I'm like, wow, this is weird, man. <laughs> this is weird. I mean, as great as Solomon is and how rich as he is, he didn't have that at his disposal. And he could add anything he wanted. You say, what's the point of all that, preacher? Is that we have all this stuff, and he has all that stuff, and yet he had the book of Proverbs at disposal. He had his daddy in the book of Psalms. He had, at least he's got some of Job. It's the oldest book ever written. And he still has gotten to this point in his life where he says, you know what? This is all vanity. It's all under the sun. And all he can see is in front of his nose and as far as the sky goes. And that's the wisest man that's ever lived outside of Jesus Christ. That's where most saved people live. Most saved people live under the sun. Most people live vain lives, just absolutely consume with themselves and consume with things that they think are going to bring happiness and joy, and they never do. So let's take a look at some things from the old King James Bible here, man, about Psalm. Pick up verse number one with me. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Israel. Uh, I'm sorry, king in Jerusalem. Verse number two. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. You got all the money in the world, you got all the things at your disposal, you got your own zoo, you got your own throne, and all you can say is this is nothing. You know, do you folks know what vanity is? Vanity is emptiness, it's nothing. You know what's so crazy when you get dressed in the morning? What do you typically get dressed or you get in front of a vanity? You know why you get in front of a vanity? Because you want to look at somebody that is so vain, but you think you're not vain, but you want to prove to yourself you're not vain by putting on a little mascara, and God says, take a good look at that. Or whatever you do, wear your extra small t-shirts, Polly. If you are there, or wherever it is, man, you throw a little try, a little buy in there, and then you go on, and God goes, vanity. Yeah. 
What a great, you say, see, God has a trick on everybody. I don't, I don't believe that Bible. You use the Bible every day and you don't even know it. Oh, that, that book's archaic. Yeah, and you're still using the words that God is supposedly used archaic words 400-something years ago, and God just sneaks them right in your life and your, your whole culture every day. A vanity is for you to realize that you're nothing. How do you like that when a preacher says you're nothing and looks you right now and says, you're all nothing? Yep. You're nothing. And then I look at myself and go, you're nothing. Doesn't that hurt you, man? You know what wells up inside you? Who is he to talk like that? I didn't. God just did. And he says, I'm a preacher. You need preaching. You don't need somebody to fill your ears with more teaching. Your head's so big you can't even get a hat to fix it. Every brother James got a hat to can fix it. Anyway. Uh, you, your head's so big and full of knowledge and you ain't got nothing in your heart, man. You need preaching to move your heart. Yes. And teaching is good. I like it. And you, it's a gift given by God to teach you. But you and I need preaching. I try to find the hardest guys on, on the internet I can find, guys of our ilk and who believe what we believe, just to tear me apart, man. You need preaching. You don't need somebody to get their smooth words, reading from his little three-by-five card. You can probably tell that doesn't happen around here. It's preaching. It's not screaming. It's not taking a verse and just pitching a fit. It's, I'm excited about this. I'm exhorted about this. This is real to me. This is not just, oh, something I do on Sundays. No, this is my life. And I am an epic failure at it. But I'm trying to get better for my Savior. But you need preaching. You need somebody to say, you're nothing. Oh, I came to Sunday at church. Hey, what'd your preacher preach on? I'm nothing. Wow, what a depressing place that is. No, to the one that's filled with the Spirit of God, that's exactly what you and I need to hear. And the preacher says, you're nothing. A preacher says nothing. You, you know what? Your best, your best day? Your best day? Oh, you know what? There's, there's three guys that hit 500 home runs and 3,000 hits. Eddie Murray, Hank Aaron, and Willie Mays. Three out of the literally tens of thousands of baseball players that played Major League Baseball, there's three of them that have 500 home runs and 3,000 hits. To me, that's phenomenal as a, as a baseball player. And God looks down and goes, nothing. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm uh, what's, what's the fastest guy in the world, that Bolden guy? What's his name? Hussein, uh, Hussein Bolt is his name. I beheld Satan fall from light, <laughs> from heaven's light. <laughs> anyway, he, ran, he runs like a 9-6 or 9-7. He is running like 30. He's running like somebody's chasing him, man. Yeah. God looks down and goes, <laughs> I made all the stars with my breath. I made Jupiter with one word. And you think you're something? Do you know if I took my breath away from you, you'd go back to the ground? You arrogant, self-righteous, cocky, nothing. Walking by, enjoying God's air and his heartbeat in your chest, thinking you just got it going on, God goes, vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. That's Ecclesiastes. That's the, that's, if, if he had just stayed with that and not gotten so full of the wisdom God gave him and the wealth God gave him. Maybe he would have done better. Listen, folks, I'm not talking about walking around just, you know, like schlep rock and the clouds always over me and woe is me, Flintstone, and I just can't do anything right. I'm talking about know who you are in Christ, yes, but know who you are compared to Almighty God. It'll keep that shine off you. It'll keep that... You, you know what I'm talking about. We have all got it, man. We've all got that arrogant look and that proud take, man. We've all, we, every, every one of us. And God says, you have nothing without me. Well, let's take a look at a couple things here. See what we get through this morning. I'd like to say this as we get going. Your earthly work and your earthly labor. Notice what I said. Now remember, this is the carnal man. This is the worldly man. We're going to contrast that to the way you and I should be thinking. Remember, Heavenly minded versus under the sun thinking. Earthly labor and earthly work is absolutely vanity. Now, for you, those of you who work with your hands all the time or have to do stuff, you know that's horrible. 
How many of us that have worked around guys that have worked for 35, 40, 45 years? I worked with a guy that just celebrated his 45th year at Hamilton Sunstrand. 45 years. He started when he was 17, some change. He graduated high school. There was some crazy rule in Connecticut that allowed him to work when he was not 18 at the time. He started at Hamilton in 1979. I was 12 years old, man, when he started. It shows you how old I am now. Most of you folks weren't even born in 1979. You're like, 1879, 1779? 45 years there. And I'm thinking to myself, and I've witnessed this guy many times. He lives in Ellington. He's a friend of mine. We're, we're actually very, I coached his kids in, in, in town basketball in Ellington. And I'm thinking to myself about this whole thing. 45 years is a phenomenal amount of time to do anything. <laughs> Seriously. Let alone be faithful to a job. And he's a good worker and he's smart. And I'm thinking to myself, he's going to retire. And he's going to make it maybe a year or so. And he's going to die. You say, you're just morbid. How many people do you know that have worked and worked and worked to 62, 65, 67, and they're dead within a year? What was all that labor for? What was all that work for? What was all that travail for? Yes, you should do a good job and be a good employee for your employer. 100% you should. You should make your company money and be profitable to your employer. Without a question, have a good testimony for your Savior if you're saved. But at the end of it, what does it all matter? Well, I'm saving for my 401k. <gasps> Boom! Widowmaker, done. Yeah. Should you save up some money? Sure you should. Is it wrong to put a, have a Roth IRA? No, it's not. But what is your mindset at, save person? Yeah. Are you thinking about this earth and this earth only? and Just work, 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 work. I think you've made work an excuse to serve Jesus Christ. I'm talking about earthly work. I'm talking about earthly labor. Why, how, how come you always got to work when there's church? How, don't get quiet right there, man. How come you always got to work when there's an opportunity to go out and street preach? Now we're getting into weeds. How come you always got to find something to do when it's time for Woodlake? We don't have a lot of ministries around here, but you can find yourself faithful to show up. You will make time for what you make time for. And don't just tell me you're saving up for the future. We'll get to him in a minute. But this all this labor and this earthly labor and this earthly work, what's it going to matter if you croak and you're saved and you did nothing for your Savior? You are all earthly minded under the sun and that's all you cared about and you worked and you worked and you worked and you worked and you died. Yeah. What then? You're morbid. No, I'm biblically based in sound knowing that this life is a vapor. Right. At the best, it's a tale that's told. Yeah. It, you read it in Psalm, it's a hand breath. Look at your hand. You think you're going to live on... If you, if you lived 120 years, what's that compared to forever? Look what the Bible says to me in verse number 3. And we'll get into this. We're going to jump around a little bit. Sorry, Brother Maines. Verse number 3. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? Verse number 14, same chapter. Stick with me. We're going to move quick. Verse 14. I have seen all the works that are undone under the sun, and behold... All is vanity and vexation of spirit. Chapter 2, verse number 11. Then I looked on all the works of my hand, uh, that my hands had wrought, and on, all, and, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Same chapter, look at verses 18 and 19. Yea, I hated all my labor. <laughs> That, that's Monday morning. Yea, I hate all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. <laughs> that's first and second shift, Brother Mike. Verse number 19. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Who knows if he's going to handle what I did right or wrong? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor when I have labored, and when I have shown myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. I did all the work, laid it all out, got the tools set, and this guy gets all the credit and gets the reward. That's vanity, man. Do you see where he's going? It has nothing to do with you being a good worker or a good employee. He's saying, what is your heart invested in? Yeah. I made the Eiffel Tower. Big whoop. You're going to die and go to hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I rushed for 2,000 yards in a season. My name's O.J. Simpson. Yeah. He died and went off to eternity. Right. Don't know if he's saved or lost. You think God looks down and goes, hey, OJ, good job with those 2,000 yards back in 1973 for the Buffalo Bills, and he did it in 14 games, which is unbelievable, not that I paid attention. But then, and, and God goes, oh, 
What would you do with my son, Jesus Christ? Yes. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Mm -hmm. All that work, all the labor, all those stairs you ran, all those weights you lifted, all those, all those tackling drills you went through, all the time you went for, is there anything wrong with getting better at your craft? No. But well, where is your heart, Christian? Mm -hmm. Is it all invested in earthly labor and earthly work? The wisest man that ever lived said, I cannot believe the time and effort I put into this thing. And it's nothing. Under the sun, under the sun. Look with me in chapter 3. Come on, chapter 3, verse number 9. This is the most for the morning, probably in this one spot. I don't even know how much we're going to get through, but we'll get through what we can. 3 9. What profit hath he that worketh in all wherein he laboreth? Great question. Look at chapter 5, verse 16, folks. 5 16. And this also is a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? All that work, and here comes a tornado. Here, I'm not laughing at the tornado, the hurricane. I'm like, look at this house. I Man, I put hurricane-proof shutters on here. I put tornado-proof foundation on. God goes, Whew. And you look, you laughing at that? No, I'm laughing at the heart that thinks that actually means something compared to eternity. Save person. What, where are you at with your labor? Is it my job, my job, my job, my job, my job, my job? Or is it your work for the Lord that really matters? Do I know you need to pay bills? Yes, let's not be foolish. You know that. But what's it going to matter when the hearse pulls you down the road? Had one yesterday. We were, at, uh, we were at, in East Hartford. And I, I, I think it was a military funeral of some sort. A military, I think he was a cop that was a military guy. The hearse went by and it said, United States Army on it. Seal the whole nine. And then a bunch of police cars, I know what I but there were some other guys that were police behind us. So my guess, he's an army guy, a arm, uh, uh, former uh, uh, army guy, and, and, and a cop. Those are two pretty, oh, I don't care what you think about cop. We're not, this is not, we don't care. We don't get into politics right now. I don't care what you think about. But he's a cop and, a, and an army guy. Do you think that matters when he took his last breath? You think God looked at the stripes on his arm or the stars on his, his epaulets? You think he looked at his hat? You think God saluted a four-star general and said, really glad to have you up here. No, he did not. Because he is the captain of the Lord's host. He's the commander-in-chief. And all that labor and all that work, which there's nothing wrong with it. What did you really bank up for over there? If you're lost here today without Christ, you say, I'm not lost. I'm sitting at 42, 47 Main Street. No, lost means you're not saved the Bible way. The one thing I've run into in my years of witnessing to people and in before I got saved is I think my works can get me there. That's, I grew up Roman Catholic. That's the way I grew up. I'm not mocking that or making fun of that situation whatsoever. At least I knew Jesus Christ. I knew he died on a cross. I did believe that and rose from the dead. But what that religion teaches is, well, your good works will outweigh your bad. How is that going to work if you're lost against somebody who's never sinned? The answer is it will not work. You're either saved by grace through faith or you're lost, dead in trespass and sins. I hope you get saved because the work's been completed through Jesus Christ. But I'm mainly talking to saved people today. Where, where's your viewpoint on your labor? Is it under the sun? Is, is it, is it got any profit in eternity? Look with me over in Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14. This is a great verse, man. And it's, this isn't, folks, this is not contradictory, but let me, let me ask you, let me, let me ask you a serious question, Brother Carlos. Who wrote the book of Proverbs? Solomon. Who wrote Ecclesiastes? Solomon. Somebody read 1423 for me. Brother Mike Vendetti, read 1423. In all that labor there is profit, but to talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. Pen, yeah, penury. What, what was the first part of that verse, Brother Mike? In all that labor there is profit. In all labor there's what? There's profit. What did he just say in Ecclesiastes? There is no profit. What happened? The labor became under the sun. 
Not for God. Not with God in mind. You're going to see something that's going to go on that's really strange. He mentions God in chapter 1. He doesn't mention him for like a chapter and a half. In my heart, my heart, my view, my look, my... Yeah, that's what happens to save people. My look, my view, my life, my kids. Blah, blah. You don't have anything without Almighty God. You don't have a family. You don't have a car. Or you're relying on... Yeah, he is. He's not religion's a crutch. He's my whole body cast. Without Jesus Christ, I have nothing. And you see what shifted between 1423 and Ecclesiastes? What happened, old Solly baby? Because you started looking under the sun, man. You start thinking this labor was all towards you and my kingdom and everything. And then you looked around and said, I'm going to die and my kid's going to take this Rehoboam. And I have built everything up and now he's going to get to live in my house I made for him. He's going to argue over the will who gets what. And what good did this all do? What happened there, old Solly baby? You, you, started think, you, you, you stopped thinking like a wise man. And you started thinking like a worldly man. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. We'll put this one to bed. There's only about 15,000 more of these. It's good. Got to start somewhere. 1 Corinthians 15. The Bible says this in verse 58. I want to encourage you with this, and the Lord wants to encourage you with this, save folks. 1558 says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain, where? It's not in vain if it's in the Lord. Isn't that a great contrast? It's not in vain, but Solomon said it was in vain. You know why? Because he got rid of God in his work and his labor. Why do you work? Why do you labor? Why do you go on the streets? Why do you go to Woodlake? Why do you do what you do? Why do you, why do, you do a good job on your job? Why, why, why are you faithful? It should be for Jesus Christ and Him and Him alone. And not just to get rewards, but because I've already been rewarded that I'm not in hell burning right now. Yes. And to whom much is forgiven, man, much is required. And she's been forgiven much. She loves a lot. If you've been forgiven of a lot, you love a lot. And let me tell you something, if you don't think you've been forgiven of a lot, you don't know how wicked and wretched you really were. You and I have been, that's Luke chapter 7. Simon, you haven't, you haven't, you haven't washed my, you didn't offer me any water, didn't wash my hands or my feet. This woman, since the day I came, the moment I came in, she has ceased not to kiss my feet and wash my feet. You know why, Simon? Because she's forgiven a lot. She loves a lot. That's why you and I should labor for the Lord. Not because of the rewards only, though those are real. We should labor because we love our Savior and our King. Because we've been forgiven of much. All right, back to Ecclesiastes. I hope you kept a marker there. I didn't, but I'm just telling you what to do because I'm your preacher. I can do that. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> right, Haley? That's the way we rolled in our crib. Yep, you better believe, get an amen on that sister right there. <laughs> All right. Second one. So you had earthly labor and work. Look at 2.1 with me, folks, of Ecclesiastes. I said in mine heart, oh boy. Oh boy. Does, does anybody know anything about the heart in Jeremiah 17.9? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. If you're desperate, no other option. You are not good in your heart. I'm a good person. Compared to who? Maybe you are. But ultimately, you've got to be compared to the one who has no sin in him. Jesus Christ. Now, just bear with me for a minute. The Bible says, I said in mine heart, go to now. I will prove thee. This is what he, this is what he says in his heart. Go to now. I will prove thee with mirth. That's happiness. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. I'd like to say this earthly pleasure is absolutely under the sun vanity. Can you have a good time and take a vacation? Of course you can, man. If you buy a new car, seriously, thank God for it. It's an M5 twin turbo 4.4. Let your preacher borrow it to go witness for Jesus Christ. <laughs> or an AMG. The, that brother, man, you know now we're talking. Or an AMG. 
Well, if you're going to go for the top, you're going to go for the top. If you're going to witness for Jesus, go 180. That's the way you do it, man. There's nothing wrong with having a car or going on a vacation or have, if the Lord, but again, this is all going to come down to where's your heart and all this stuff, man. Are you living under the sun? Is everything vexation of spirit and vanity? Is it all going to end up in nothingness that you had the big house, but you never told your neighbor about Christ? Yes. You had a fancy car, but you never offered to take somebody to church? You see how the thinking of God's thinking is against this stuff, how different it is and contrary to you and I? It's phenomenal. Oh, bro, preacher, you really didn't read that Bible a lot. Yeah, but I don't think or act like he does an awful lot. Yeah. Working on it. But boy, when you lay your life down next to that book, you really lay it down. I have a lot more vanity in my life than I like to think I do. Oh, I can see the vanity in your lives, but I don't like the vanity in my life. And I live a lot of my life under the sun, boy. And I get just as carnally and earthly minded as you do. And I get into that earthly pleasure mode, too. There's nothing wrong with taking rest time. You know, over Mark chapter 6, when they had no leisure, no, no so much to eat, Jesus said, come in your part. Come, come on out to the desert place. You need some time away from everybody. You need some time for food. You need some time for refreshment. Let me tell you this. Is it, this is going to sound horrible. You should get some sleep for yourself. Just don't love sleep lest I'll come to poverty and be like that door on the hinge that turns. But you need sleep, man. Preferably not now in this hour, but you need sleep. <laughs> you need sleep, man. Your body needs it. That's a pleasurable thing. I think sleep, I, I think sleep of a laboring man who's done something for Christ and can lay his head down or her head down for there's no sleep like in the face of this earth. You don't have people knocking at your door, man. You don't have a restraining order against you. You don't have to worry about the cops coming. You didn't do nothing. And you just go, thank you, Father, for the day. Yeah. Seeing about five hours. <laughs> right when you're reading the book of Chronicles and you face plant right in it. <laughs> but what happens is when you're under the sun as a carnal Christian, your pleasures override Jesus Christ. You say, that would never happen, preacher. It happens more than you think it is. It's very subtle. Remember, your enemy, the serpent, is very subtle. He's not loud about anything. He's not over the top about anything. He's very subtle how he slips in there. And as Paulie said in Sunday school, you start saying your time, my time, my time. No, it's his time. And the thought of foolishness is sin. Even your thoughts of just foolishness and pleasure can become sin. Because it's all under the sun. It's all, it all becomes vanity and of no profit to anybody. You've got to guard your heart, man, every second through that book. You've got to let the Spirit of God guide you. Because before you know it, you'd be caught up in so much earthly pleasure, the things of God mean nothing to you. I know you get nervous when Sunday comes. I do too. And Wednesday night, I know you do too. Because wouldn't it be easier just to stay at home and put the SpongeBob's on and kick it and kick it for an hour watching Looney Tunes? You know I'm not a church attendance guy, so don't even look at me like that. You know me better than that. But I, I just want to know why is this an option? Is the preaching boring? Is the teaching bad? Is the doctrine off? Is the fellowship horrible? What's keeping you from investing in Jesus Christ and spending some time? Is it the pleasures of this life? Do you just love everything in this life more than you love your Savior? I hope you're nervous and bothered right now. I hope you're twitching like a stinking long-haired cat in a, rock, in a room full of rocking chairs. Because we all have that. We all love pleasures and things that distract us from Jesus Christ. It's overwhelming. And this... Is, it's every, folks, everything in this world is generated to elicit a response from you. Yeah. Sexual response, uh, joy, fake joy response, uh, an excitement response, an anger response. It's all geared to get you in. As a child of God, I've got to temper that out. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a what? A <laughs> say it's broken down without walls. You start letting that thing run wild with pleasures, the walls of your protection, like Brother Paul said about the shield, they come down, and your city is defenseless against the enemy attack. Pleasures, man. Folks, you're talking about a man who had a thousand women. I'm not going off the rails for a minute. He could have been with a woman for three years and never saw the same one twice. 
So don't tell me this book's not real. He could have had as many, quote unquote, whatever you want in his life between wealth and women and everything else. And he goes, wow, this is just to get it all and mirth and happiness. What, what a waste. I wish saved people would think like that. Look what the Bible says to me over in Luke. Luke chapter number 8. It's getting a little thick there, so we've got to turn some pages to get some fanning going on. You think this is fun stuff to go through? It's not, man. Trust me. It's horrible. But it's meant to be an encouragement to you. It's meant to be an exhortation to you. It's meant, it's meant to get me ready and to get you ready to see our Savior face to face. And see those eyes of flame of fire looking right at you, man. 8.4. Bear with me. I know you know this particular passage, but 8.4 of Luke has a particular word in it. The other accounts in Matthew 8 and Mark 4 does not. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake, a, a spake, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it. That's interesting. In other words, the thorns allow it to grow together with the seed. In other words, it's not pruned back. The thorns sprang up with it and choked it, and other fell on good ground, sprang up, and bare fruit in hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You got ears this morning. Your Savior's talking to you, man. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but others in parables that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed. I like how God explains this book to you. Now this parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. If you're lost here today, that's what the devil's trying to do to you. Take that word out so you don't get saved. Verse 13, they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. But look at this one. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life under the sun, under the heaven, and bring no fruit to perfection, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Go with me over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, please. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I've heard this before. Well, you need to hear it again, man. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. That pleasures thing only occurs in that passage in Luke about the same parable about the seed and the sower. It's very interesting. To me, it is anyway. It's that earthly pleasure where it overrides what you should do. I like that phrase he puts in there, the Holy Ghost puts in there, this life. I'm trying to live for that life. And my life is hid with God, or hid with Christ in God. Look what the Bible says to me in 3.1. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, This know also in the par uh, last days perilous times shall come. There shall be earthquakes in diverse places and blood moons and shemitas. No, stupid. That's Matthew 24. It's the advent of Christ. Wake up and rightly divide your Bible. This know also in the last days perilous times shall come. That's for the church age. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady. Well, you got a lot of traitors in Christianity today, unfortunately. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of, look at this one, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Oh, but I show up to church, preacher, I carry my Bible with me, got a scripture sign on my, on my car. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, hang out with them and have a good time. Get away from them. Oh, preacher, I show up on Sunday. Man, I even drop a big 10% in there because you don't tithe. And you don't... Yeah, but you've got no power of God in your life because you love the pleasures. More than you love God. I just, I, I, I want, I, I'd love to see, now I don't keep a calendar because I just don't keep a calendar, but I have a calendar in my mind, which is even worse. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. and it's locked in forever. There are dates and times specifically throughout the week, days and times, excuse me, that are locked in. Well, that's because you're a preacher. No, Sundays and Wednesdays were always on the docket for my family and myself. Yeah. And Taylor, Haley, they can attest to it. They will or I'll kill them. <laughs> we went to church. Sunday was for church. Yeah. Wednesday night was for church or Brother Bert used to have it on Tuesday. Because he wasn't really saved, so we just met on, <laughs> we, 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 we met on any day of the week. We didn't really care, man. But we met, that was not an option. Thursday night jail ministry, not an option. I'm going. What happens if nobody shows up? I'm going. What happens if there's one guy there? I'm going. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. You got somebody in here that's thankful, Bob? Amen. And several others, man. Yeah. Those things are non-negotiable. Yeah. Saturday morning, not negotiable. Yes. If I got things to do, it's after one o'clock. Yes. Yeah. Not negotiable. Friday night, every two weeks. Yeah. Woodlake, not negotiable. Yeah. Oh, you're just starting. No, no, no. I'm talking. I understand if you get in a car wreck. Or an albino rhinos, rhinoceros comes through your living room. I understand that. But the reality is this. Those things don't happen. Yeah. You just are consumed with the pleasures of this life. Yeah. And you love you more than you love Jesus Christ. And you love you more than you love others. Mm -hmm. And this comes from a man that could have a different woman every night for three years. Could ever have every drink at his disposal. He, could have all, he had all the wealth in the world. And he was wiser than anybody. You could get the ten wisest men in the world, and they couldn't touch Solomon. And he goes, mirth, merriment, pleasure. Where did he start off looking for that in chapter 2, verse 1? Mine heart. When your heart gets away from Jesus Christ, you'll do anything. Take it for somebody who has. As I say, you'll do anything. I don't believe he could do that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Your flesh, as I said before, can do anything a lost person can do except for go to hell. If you're saved. And Solomon says, you know what? Pleasure of this life, they'll take you down, man. It's all vanity and vexation. Now, he said in his heart, and I know we quote Jeremiah, I, I, need, I need to give you I need to give you two more. We've got to shut this down. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, please. You notice that term pleasure and how it's vanity and all that. The earthly pleasure. But there are pleasures in the Lord, man. You can't tell me when you get to witness to somebody, that's not the most joyous thing in your life when you get to spend five times. You can't tell me. You're not beaming. You're not beaming from ear to ear with a grin going, why would you let me talk about you to anybody? Yes. And that stays with you for a long time until you decide to let your heart roam and you get filled with the pleasure of this world and then it kind of, you're like, and then when the next time comes to preach, well, yeah, it was a good time, but I've got other things to do now. There's nobody I've ever met that's ever gone on the street or ever had a good witness and opportunity that was ever mad about it. Yeah. So why would you forsake that pleasure of doing that for the Lord and then go consume yourself with that pleasure? You know why? Mine heart my heart said, let me go get some mirth and pleasure. Wow, that's vanity, man. Honestly, you, you, you and I that love to traffic in sin as saved people, let's just be real about it this morning. We like to traffic a little bit in sin, unfortunately. Have you ever been happy after you've been done with that sin? Has that sin ever fulfilled every bit? That's your flesh desires. No, it's always, I don't know this. I've never, I'm not being smart. I've never done heroin. I've heard that you're hooked or you're dead the first time you do it. You know what you're hooked to? Getting that first time feeling back. Yes. That never can happen because it's never the first time again. And the same as a saved person with your flesh, you'll do it once and then, the next time you journey off into your flesh, you'll try to try something more severe as a saved person. And it will never fill you. And Solomon said, I, I, I warned you guys. I've been the wise man. 
I've been the heavenly man. I'm warning you by being a carnal, worldly man. Don't do it. Under the sun, no profit. It's all vanity. Look what the Bible says to me in Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 24 says this, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He made a choice, folks. He's not even a saved man in the body of Christ, an Old Testament saint. As, how could he do that? Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, a picture of the world. For he had, he had respect under the recompense of the reward. Would you say he was not heavenly minded when he said, I'm leaving Egypt? Whereas Solomon in Ecclesiastes is all earthly minded and carnally minded and worldly minded. Moses said, you know what? I learned a lot in Egypt. I had one of the greatest degrees. I went to the University of Egypt. I graduated rock cum laude. I could build a pyramid with the best of them. I could, I could do it all, man. And then he gets out in the desert and spends a little time with God alone. And he goes, you're a lot better than that. You're a lot better. That burning, you're a lot better than that. I'm forsaking Egypt. And I'm going your way. Really? With all those people that are going to hate you? Your sister and your brother are chiding you because of the woman you married? Really? You're not being able to see the promise land because you smoked the rock? Really? Fiery servants, Moses? Really? Dathed, Korah, and Byram? Really? Yep. I esteem all that as being nothing compared to you. Solomon had a little problem with that. He said the pleasure of sin, folks, sin is pleasurable for a season, but it ends in bitterness. And Moses said, man, if I stick to the pleasures of my Savior, my God, the God of the Bible, I'll never run out of it. Last one, Psalm 16. I thought we were going to get a little further, but that's okay. You guys pulled me in. I tried to get out, but every time I get out, you guys pull me back in. Psalm 16. Bible preaching is very difficult to come by nowadays. Yeah. And it's sad. I don't say this with any shine at all, but it's sad there's not more Bible churches like this. Yeah, I don't care 25, 30, 50 people. I don't care. I'm talking Bible churches yeah. that preach the book, can have a good time with their Savior, can sing some songs on and glorify Him, can get along with one another. It, why is that a rarity now? Well, I know why. It's, you, you read it, Perilous Times Shall Come. Lovers themselves. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Save people get like that. You won't esteem others better than yourselves. And your joy and your pleasure becomes of this world. Look what the Bible says to me over verse number 11. Of course it would be 1611. Why wouldn't it be? Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore where are your pleasures coming from saved person what, do you, what are you laboring for what's your work based on does it have an eternal weight of, of glory or does it have a temporary one are your pleasures only about you and your love for yourself and flesh and family or do you get your pleasures from the presence of the Lord that's where it should come from. God is not against vacations. He's not against any of that stuff. He just wants to know where your heart is in all of this. And Solomon strayed from that. And he strayed from God. Hopefully he gets back to it. We'll see how it plays out. Father, thank you for the morning opportunity to look into your book. And I thank you for the conviction of it personally. Father, if there was nobody else in the room, it's uh, all directed towards me. Father, um, you deal with me every time I read through the Proverbs when you say, my son. And that's, that's just very, it's very pointed to me when you say, my son. And Father, I know all the book is written for me. But Father, that, that's just so direct when you say, my son. And Father, you've, uh, you've spoken to me about these things in my life that are lacking. I pray you would 
strengthen me with might by your spirit in the inner man that I might put these things down and be a better child of God for you. And I pray the same for the folks here that are saved, that, uh, Father, you'd strengthen them with might by your spirit in the inner man as well. That, Father, our pleasures would come from your right hand, from you and not from ourselves, and not from the things of Egypt, that we'd forsake the, the things and the shiny baubles this world offers and we would just be engrossed with the pleasures of you, Father, and your Son in this book. Thank you again for the morning, Father. Thank you for the folks that came out. I do pray, that, Father, as we depart, that you'd uh, give us a prosperous journey and bring us back tonight at the appointed hour. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.